All right, so um, I just want to welcome, we have about half a dozen people in the room. Cool. And we have Eau Claire County Alliance for Substance Misuse Prevention um, to talk to us a little bit today about how we can talk to our own children, how we can talk to youth about substance uh, and kind of look for some of those signs that more conversation might be needed. So, all right, ladies, I'll let you take it away. Perfect. Hey, great. All right, should be on. All right, um, so we'll get started. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. We will talk at you for around an hour, probably less than that, so we can have you guys ask them some questions. Um, but to start, I will go through a brief agenda. So I don't know, Margaret, you wanna go on the next slide? There we go. Um, so Margaret and I will introduce ourselves more. Uh, we'll talk about substances. We'll look at local data, and then we'll also give some resources for you guys. Um, next slide. Uh, so my name is Kate Kensel. I am a community health educator at the Eau Claire City County Health Department. I also work with the Alliance for Substance Misuse Prevention. Um, so my role at the health department really focuses on preventing youth and, uh, from using substances and also working with local SAD and SAFE groups. Yep, um, and I'm Margaret Davies. So I'm an epidemiologist with the Eau Claire City County Health Department. Um, I also work on the Alliance for Substance Disease Prevention. Um, so my job and data is primarily around youth um, substance misuse and mental health and um, kind of seeing how we can use data to quantify and prevent that. Alrighty, so, um... We're, like I said before, we're from the Alliance for Substance Misuse Prevention. So usually we have this like really long thing that we go through. We condense it down to like two slides. Um, so the Alliance for Substance Misuse Prevention started in 2002 and we aim to improve the lives of children, youth and adults by preventing and treating alcohol, tobacco and other drugs, drug misuse. Um, so we partner with many organizations and we try to focus our prevention efforts towards a common goal of uh, substance misuse prevention and treatment in our community. Um, do I go on the next slide? Yeah. So as you can see, the Alliance consists of multiple members and one of the community sectors that we work with is parents. Um, so us talking to you today really um, is a part of the Alliance talking um, preventing the substance misuse with youth. Um, but the Alliance has plans to expand communication with parents by starting a parent newsletter and also working on providing more learning opportunities for parents. Okay. Um, so we just wanted to get a couple of definitions out of the way um, throughout this presentation, just so that we're all sort of on a common ground. Um, so, We'll talk a little bit about risk factors. Um, so these are characteristics that are typically associated with a higher um, likelihood or a higher chance of negative outcomes. So in our case, um, using substances. Um, so some examples of risk factors might be like hunger in the home, um, lack of sleep, having an immediate family member with a substance use disorder. Those can all be risk factors for a um, teen having some of these issues. Um, protective factors are kind of the opposite. So those are those characteristics that are associated with a lower uh, chance of negative outcomes. Um, so things like a feeling of belonging, having um, a supportive adult in their life um, can be protective factors that we might um, examine. And then substance misuse. So we wanted to call attention to the fact that this refers to kind of two things. It can refer to the use of illegal drugs. So things like heroin, cocaine, or meth. Um, but it can also refer to the inappropriate use of illegal substances or sorry, of legal substances. So things like um, underage drinking would be considered substance misuse. Um, a pregnant person using alcohol or tobacco would be substance misuse. Um, so we just wanted to call out that it doesn't always just refer to illegal drugs. Um, it can also be the inappropriate use of those legal substances. And then the YRBS, um, we're going to talk a lot about this. This is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So this is a survey that's given um, every other year to um, middle and high schoolers. Um, and it's where we get a lot of our uh, local data. So you'll hear that a lot, but we just wanted to let you guys know what that stands for um, in case I forget to define it later. That's what that is. 
Um, so we're going to look at some substances. We'll talk a little bit about kind of what they are, um, why they're a concern in teens. And um, there's a couple where we talk about like ways to prevent and then we'll do kind of a big um, resource session at the end there. I forgot my words. All right. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is alcohol. Um, so alcohol is actually one of the most commonly used substances among young people um, in the United States. So while we do see um, a decline in rates of current drinking, which is usually defined as having a drink in the last 30 days um, and binge drinking among high school students, um, it's still a incredibly common substance. Um, typically, male students have had higher rates of um, drinking, um, both just current drinking and binge drinking, but we we're actually starting to see a shift into female students having higher rates of that. Um, and then in 2019, about 29% of high schoolers were reporting um, past 30 day use and that's at a national level. Um, so concerns around alcohol. So like, why is it a problem when teens are drinking? So um, early use of alcohol can be associated with the development of alcohol use disorder later in life. Um, and that is correlated, especially with the earlier drinking starts. So looking at starting at age 13 versus 15, there's a correlation. The earlier it starts, the more likely that um, development of that disorder is. Um, alcohol use can also lead to a lot of social problems. It can lead to legal problems, problems in school. So um, not paying attention, not being able to finish, um, not graduating can also lead to things like unwanted um, or unprotected sexual activity, uh, disruption of normal growth, so physically um, and mentally as well. Um, increased risk of suicide and homicide with um, underage drinking. Uh, and then there's definitely concerns about drinking and driving um, and other unintentional injuries. So it's really cold outside right now. Um, we do see issues with um, you know, drinking at parties and trying to walk home um, and that can really be a problem. Um, alcohol use in teens is also associated with the misuse of other substances. So um, marijuana, prescription drugs, um, et cetera, are often seen kind of co-used. Um, there's also a lot of concerns about changes in brain development. Um, and some of those changes can have lifelong effects. So we actually have a picture on this next slide here. Um, so this is the effects of heavy drinking on um, teen brains. So this is a scan of a 15-year-old non-drinker that's in labeled in the yellow, it's on the left on my screen, but I'm realizing I don't know if it's flipped for you guys, but it's the one labeled in yellow. Um, and then a heavy drinker on, well, the right for me labeled in pink. So this is during a memory test. And you can see that the non-drinker is using a lot of the parts of the brain. It's, they're creating those memories. Um, whereas this heavy drinker, you only see this like little area of activity up kind of in the frontal cortex, which is where um, a lot of short-term memory is created, but it doesn't store. And so thinking about that, um, you know, going through school, going through life, not making these memories, these connections, um, alcohol can have this really hard impact um, on the brain. Um, additionally, we know that the brain is still developing until about age 25. So these two 15 year olds still have about another decade of brain development to undergo. So you can start to see kind of the impacts of um, continually drinking as a teenager, um, as that brain's still developing, it can cause a lot of problems and cause the brain to really struggle to develop correctly. Um, so we do have some resources we'll talk about, um, I think Kate will touch on later about sort of talking about your teens about not using alcohol, but I think this picture is a good one to also keep. Um, we also wanna talk a little about, about opioids and prescription drugs. Um, so just to kind of name what opioids are, so that can be legal drugs um, that you get from your doctor. So things like um, Percocet, hydrocodone, um, morphine. Um, they can also be illegal, such as heroin or manufactured fentanyl. Um, but one of the things that these all have in common is that they are highly addictive. Um, and in Wisconsin, we know that about one in six residents were prescribed and used an opioid in the last year. Um, and opioids kind of work in a variety of ways, but the main thing is that they impact the brain um, and they interact with these opioid receptors in our brain. And one of the um, side effects of that is pain relief, which is why they're often prescribed after a surgery, um, for example. But they also can stimulate this reward pathway and that can cause these feelings of euphoria, um, well-being, happiness, kind of coziness. Um, and it's the continued activation of this pathway that can make opioids addictive. And so some of the concerns around that is that um, overdose. So um, opioids typically um, 
you typically develop a little bit of tolerance to them. So doses start increasing over time and this can lead to um, an overdose um, because opioids not only impact the way we feel, but they can impact our physical body, including breathing. Um, and they can slow or stop that breathing, which um, is not compatible with life. So that can lead to death. Um, injectable opioids such as fentanyl or heroin can also um, increase the risk for certain bloodborne diseases. So HIV, hepatitis B, um, C, and um, it can also lead to infection at the injection site, which might lead to sepsis and also death. Um, and about 14% of high schoolers nationally were reporting um, misusing a prescription pain medication. Um, and we're going to get to our first uh, video here. So we're gonna hope that <laughs> this works. Um, so this is a video put out by the Alliance for Substance Misuse Prevention, um, helping to prevent some of this prescription drug misuse. So I'm gonna try to get this to share. Me one second here to make sure that I'm sharing the sound. Sorry, is the sound playing, Carissa? No. Okay. Uh, there it is. Now it is. I wasn't sure if it would save. I don't know how Zoom works. All right. <laughs> Try this. Did you know that what's in our medicine cabinets could actually lead to overdose or addiction? Not everyone thinks of prescription painkillers. The same drugs prescribed to us by our doctors and our dentists when they think of the opioid the crisis. Moving. Studies show that unused prescription. What was that, Kate? You is the screen moving for you guys or no? No, we're just hearing it. We're not seeing it. Oh yeah. no! <laughs> I was like, oh look, it's working. Um, <laughs> no, the screen's not. I know. Showing the video. <laughs> oh, no. oh no! Oh no! Okay, well it was working earlier. Um, I am not sure how to fix that, Kate. <laughs> you have any uh, ideas? Uh when you shared your screen, did you click on a specific, like the PowerPoint or did you screen one or screen two? Mm, I only have one screen. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Otherwise I can try to pull it up if you need me to. Did you know Maybe. that what's Is it going? medicine cabinets could actually- oh. No, it's still not. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, bear with us, everyone. We are very good at technology after two years, clearly. Okay, do you want to try pulling it up and I can stop and then we'll just all get back into the PowerPoint? Yeah, I gotta okay. get to the link. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. We're going to see if Kate can pull this up. Um, and if not, then I guess um, <laughs> send... we'll skip over it. Not well, I was going to say the links are in the in the resources, so we can always send those out to pull up at a later date. Apologies, everyone. We thought we had this figured out. <laughs> Um, share sound. Okay. Hopefully this will work. Make sure the volume's all the way up. Can you see the video on YouTube? Yeah. Cool. Okay, now I'm going to hit play. Did you know that what's in our medicine cabinets could actually lead to overdose or addiction? Not everyone thinks of prescription painkillers, the same drugs prescribed to us by our doctors and our dentists when they think of the opioid crisis. Studies show that unused prescription painkillers, also known as opioids, often find their way into the wrong hands. Almost one in 10 Eau Claire County High School students say they've misused a prescription pain medication in the past month. Here's how you can help. Don't share your medication. Store it in a locked location that is out of sight, such as a personal medication lockbox. Keep track of your medication by counting your pills and drop off any unused or expired medications at a drug take back location. It's free and confidential or use a drug deactivation system. Learn more at getinvolvedasap.org. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> All right, we might have to do that uh, later as well. But okay, so that's going to bring us to the end of um, opioids, and we're going to get into marijuana. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Kate for this one. All righty. Um, so many of you may know what marijuana is, but Marijuana also has a bunch of names that come with it. So it can be called cannabis, weed, pot, dope, probably a bajillion more words, but um, it refers to dried flowers, leaves, stems, and the seed 
of a marijuana plant. So marijuana can be smoked, eaten, or vaped. Um, how it works is the chemical in marijuana is THC that comes from the plant, and then it affects the brain and produces different effects like relaxation or euphoria. But then it also, in some people, can create a sense of fear, anxiety, panic, distress, especially if it's used in a high dose. Um, if you want to go to the next one. <laughs> some concerns that are around marijuana youth use is that it can harm the developing brain, much like opioids and alcohol. Some negative effects that you will see is difficult thinking um, and problem solving, problems with memory and learning, uh, reduced coordination, difficulty maintaining attention, and then problems with um, school and social life. It can also affect the heart and lungs and negatively impact mental health. You can see on the screen that if um, there's heavier frequent use, it can lead to a temporary psychosis and also long lasting mental disorders like schizophrenia. Um, I'm gonna jump in and cover Delta-8 real quick. Um, so Delta-8 is kind of a newer um, drug of concern. Um, so this is a psychoactive substance. It is also found in marijuana and hemp plants. Um, and a lot of times, so you might see it referred to, especially in the media as kind of diet weed or weed light. So it still creates that kind of high effect that Kate talked about, um, but sort of at a lesser amount. Um, the main issue around Delta-8 is that there's a lot of gray area around it. So it is not technically illegal. Um, because it is mostly derived from the hemp plant, but because of that, there's also really no regulation around um, processing, labeling, <coughs> sales, um, and um, kind of how it can be used. Um, some other concerns with it is that a lot of times you can see I have pictures up there, but it can be put into things like chocolate bars, made into these little gummies that can look just like a regular candy. Um, so people can consume it without knowing what it is. Um, which can lead to um, overdoses or um, calls to poison control. So this is, a, like I said, it's relatively sort of new on the scene. Um, we did an environmental scan in Eau Claire County last fall, summer, fall, I wanna say. Um, we did find it for sale in several areas. Um, so it is something to kind of just be aware of out in the community. You might also see it um, sold with this little Delta symbol, the little triangle. Um, so that can be a way to recognize it on packaging. Um, but just wanted to kind of jump in and name that it is a substance. We don't have a lot of data around it because it is new. Um, a lot of surveys that look at drug use don't ask specifically about Delta-8. Um, so just wanted to talk about that one as well. And then I think Kate, you are up for yeah. vaping. I'm gonna stop so, sharing and just let you share. <laughs> yeah, um, so she has vaping up. Um, it's a newer thing with tobacco and you may have heard about it a lot, but to give a more break from us talking, I'll share some videos that the Alliance created. So, um, we did this last summer, I believe, and we shared it across, um, news sources, Facebook and stuff, but it gives really good information about the basic education about it, its consequences, um, and then how you can talk about vaping with children. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and there's like four videos that are like 20 seconds each, I think. So we'll do that. Pull this up. Take a break. Learn more about vapes. Vaping, aka e-cigarettes, jewels, mods, ends. It's not harmless water vapor. It can contain nicotine, other harmful chemicals, and it can harm brain development in youth. Build a healthier community, vape free. So she went through that pretty fast, but she kind of showed examples of the vapes at the beginning. Um, they look like USBs or just random, like some of them even look like highlighters. So it, it's really hard to tell. Um, but that's just an example. And then we'll do the health consequences. Take a break, learn more about vapes. Vaping leaves youth and adults vulnerable. It can increase risk of severe illness from infections like pneumonia, COVID-19, and the flu. 
Reduce your risk by finding prevention or quitting programs. Build a healthier community, vape free. So that's one's health consequences. And then this is the- Take a break. Learn more about vapes. Vaping is a top health priority that can affect anyone in the Chippewa Valley. Cigarette use has gone down, but vaping among high school students has risen 142% in Eau Claire County since 2015. Build a healthier community, vape free. And then this is how to talk. Take a break, learn more about vapes. Talking with youth about vaping can be difficult. Here are four steps to help you. Know the facts, start the conversation, be ready to listen and answer their questions. Build a healthier community, vape free. So those kind of went fast, but that is a general overview about vaping and e-cigarettes. Margaret will pull up the slide. <laughs> Sorry, it's a click so fast and I have so many windows open. It's a challenge. Um, all right. So um, we'll get into just some local data just to kind of bring this down to the Eau Claire level. Um, so like we said earlier, most of this data is collected through the YRBS. Um, so the survey is um, designed by DPI, which is the Department for Public Instruction in Wisconsin. Um, they designed the survey. The health department helps coordinate it with the schools. Um, results go back to DPI, who then kind of send us the school district level results so that we can report out on those. Um, just to kind of give a breakdown of how that works. Um, so in terms of data points, we look at two major ones that's past 30-day um, use and then um, lifetime use or the questions usually worded, um, have you ever used sort of fill in the blank substance. Um, so just gonna run through these um, for you guys. So alcohol for past 30-day use is about 25% um, in 2019. Uh, tobacco, which is specifically referring to um, cigarettes, cigarellos, cigars, um, and then smokeless tobacco like chew or dip, um, but does not refer to nicotine in vapes. Um, however, that's down to about 5% um, use in the past 30 days. Um, marijuana at about 14%. Vaping was reported at about 18%, and then prescription drug misuse at 9%. Um, so that's past 30 day use, looking at kind of the lifetime use of a substance, we have about 55% of high schoolers saying that they have ever used alcohol on um, 16% for that cigarette um, category, I won't name all those again, marijuana about 23%, um, vaping was reported at 39%, and then prescription drug misuse about 11% of students. Um, and again, those are all for 2019, I was really hoping the 2021 data would be available, but we are still waiting on that. Um, but we just wanted to call out some trends over time. So I didn't want to put a bunch of graphs on here. So I just want words. Um, so alcohol use is decreasing, um, but it's still the most commonly used substance among high schoolers. And we talked about that shift um, to a more sort of female use um, in the last uh, just recent years, last few years. Um, cigarette use has been decreasing um, over the past few years, past decade, really. Um, but nicotine, which is kind of the addictive drug that we worry about, um, that is actually starting to almost bump up a little bit and there needs to be a little bit more um, data collection around how we ask those questions. Um, but the cigarette use is decreasing. Um, prescription drug misuse has been increasing. Um, marijuana use has remained steady. So that 14% for the past 30 day use, that's been pretty, um, steady over time, although what we're seeing now is that the perception of risk, so kids thinking that marijuana is not risky to use, um, that perception of the risk of marijuana is going down, which is typically associated with an increase in use, so um, that will be something to see over the next few years, um, but we do notice that trend happening. And then vaping is new. So that was first asked about in 2019. So we don't have a lot of data around it. We do have about 143% increase that was named in that video, but we don't have kind of that long-term data um, because it is kind of a new substance. Um, however, there's some national data highlighting concerns around vaping. Um, it's being called an epidemic among youth. Um, so there are, there are some concerns there at a national level, which um, I think are also reflected in that local level, but we'll kind of continue collecting data going forward. Um, and then we just wanted to look at mental health as well. So this is something that students tend to be a little bit concerned about. We also know that mental health is associated with substance um, misuse as well. So um, 
I'm going to show a scorecard that was created by the Mental Health Matters Coalition. Um, they also look at the YRBS and they pull out a lot of these risk and protective factors um, around um, mental health. So this is their scorecard from 2019. So looking at protective factors, about 84% of high schoolers said that they did have at least one supportive adult beside their parents in their life. Um, but only 26% reported that most or all of the time they get emotional support when they need it. Um, also about 84% feel um, most of the time or always feel safe at school. And then 69% participate in some type of school activity team or club. Um, looking at risk factors though, we do see that about 73% of high schoolers are reporting that they sleep fewer than eight hours per night. Um, this is kind of a concerning issue. We know that sleep um, is super important for physical development, mental health as well. Um, and just having that risk factor for substance use um, is concerning. We also see about 44% of high schoolers reporting more than three hours a day of screen time, excluding for schoolwork, and about 17% saying that they've experienced electronic bullying in the past uh, 12 months. So those are some of the protective and risk factors that we look at um, that are typically associated with substance use or not. Um, so we'll get into resources. I'm gonna turn this part over uh, to Kate. Um, so going back to that, we can send you guys the full scorecard um if you would like to have like a not physical copy you could print it off too but if you want to see the full thing yourself we definitely can um but i will start talking about mock bedrooms so i just want to preface this before i talk about it um with just the fact that mock bedrooms aren't meant to encourage parents to dig through their kids stuff they're more meant to show uh what different types of everyday items could be used to conceal alcohol, tobacco, vapes, or other drugs. We really want to um, provide education and also resources on how to talk to your kids about this. We always suggest parents to look at the resources first, and then before talking to your kids about drugs, alcohol, vaping, um, think through how you might react if they tell you that they've tried something um, or use something, but also even how they will react if you confront them. So now that I've told you about that, I'll show you a little bit about the mock bedrooms that we do. So we usually have these up at parent teacher conferences. Um, so parents can walk through them, we can show them um, these items. But with COVID-19, we haven't been able to. So on the screen, you can see a couple of them that we have, we have a lot of them. Um, but these are the some that I just pulled out. So you can see there's a monster can and the top of where you think you would open it to drink is actually a spot where you can put um, like vapes, literally any substance in there. Um, and then the next one is a water bottle. So when you put it together, you can't even tell that it comes apart and there's a stash in there. Um, and then the next one I think is a speed stick. And so when you take out the deodorant part, you can see a whole section in there um, where you can put basically anything in there as well. We also um, have a, a, like a key fob and that comes apart and you can like stash stuff in there too, which I think is just crazy. Um, but then looking at the next picture, you see a scrunchie, but I don't know if you can tell on there, there's a little zipper on there. And um, you can store vapes in there, you can store pills, you can store basically anything but alcohol unless you have like the little shooters. Um, but then with the sunscreen in the back, that one is actually used to store alcohol. So even if it's not that specific one, teens can still rinse out old um, sunscreen bottles and put alcohol in there to conceal it. Um, and then there's the hairbrush, so the top part of it screws off, and then the whole section has a little storage area. And then the last one is um, a little metal can, so it's basically a scent proof can where it's usually used for marijuana, um, but it can also be used for basically anything else, like I've said. Um, so to go along with the mock bedrooms, we also have a mock backpack. So. I'll talk about the virtual one next, but um, this is more aimed towards uh, teachers. So we want to give them resources and like um, things to look out for, um, for students. Like we have uh, one that looks like a book, but when you open it, there's a little storage area in it. 
there's just like a bunch of little things that you would think is everyday school items, but it's actually used to conceal stuff. Um, but I don't have those pictured, but we will probably have those at parent teacher conferences when we have those start back up with us coming in. But then you can go to the next side, <laughs> Margaret. Um, this is a virtual mock bedroom. So this was put on by Chippewa County. They created this bedroom simulation where you can go through the bedroom to find like a normal object. But then when you click on it, it can show you it actually can be a thing that contains substances. Um, I don't know if you guys want us to go through it or not. I mean, it's probably easier for you guys to click through it and find the stuff on your own. It's time. So it's kind of like a test to see which ones you can find. Um, but like even just looking at the picture, you'll see a water bottle laying on the bed. If you can kind of see that, it was like the thing I talked about it, that you pull it apart and you can actually stash stuff in it. Um, and then that big flag on the back is a really good tell um, because it's a marijuana plant and mushrooms. So drugs. <laughs> um, I think we'll just skip over it. So then we we'll have enough time. And if we get done early, it'll be okay. Uh, so this next one is small talks. You may have heard about it. They have a lot of campaigns going on, but basically small talks is a resource that gives you talking points that can help you connect with your child on important topics like underage drinking. Um, kind of in the slide, you can see um, having small, a lot of small talks over time can help build trust and set expectations as kids change and grow. Um, but on this next slide, it shows you an example of what is in their toolkits. So kind of um, the first question is, why do I need to wait until I'm 21 to drink? And it gives you good talking points uh, to talk with your kids. And then there's, if alcohol is bad, why do you drink? And then there's, do you drink when you, did you drink when you were a kid? Um, and then the last one is, why do you keep bringing up drinking? It's not like I'm doing it. So they have different scenarios with different talking points. So it's really good if you want. This one's more focused on alcohol. Um, but the next slide that I go through is more towards tobacco. You really can make the small talks towards um, anything like prescription drugs, marijuana, vaping, any of that type of stuff. Um, if you want to go next slide. So this is the one that I was talking about. It focuses on tobacco. So tobacco is changing is a great resource that is focused on tobacco and vaping. So it focus on, focuses on the new trends of tobacco. So right now you see the trend is electronic cigarettes, um, smokeless products, sweet candy flavors, new products um, that hide addiction in plain sight. Also on this resource, it gives you... Um, tips on how to help your kids quit. And there's a fact sheet kind of like uh, the small talks one that I had that talks to you about how um, you can talk to kids about tobacco as well. I think that's all I have. Yep. Okay, and then um, I'm just gonna run through some of these quick tips on talking to teens about substance use. Um, this is a resource we have at the end as well that's a lot more expanded on these points, but I'm just going to run through them real quick because I know sometimes it's, you know, we say, okay, well, you can talk to your kids and it's like, well, you know, how? So these are some um, just quick tips. So number one, planning on having the talk. So you don't want to just like spring this on your kid. Um, this is a time to say like, hey, you know, before you go out for this event that you're going to, this dance, this party, whatever it is, um, you know, let's, let's take some time and, and talk about this. So maybe you say that on like a Wednesday and say, hey, tomorrow I wanna to talk to you um, about not drinking at the party you're going to on Friday. So kind of laying out that like, we're going to plan on having this talk can be a really great way to approach this so that you're not just springing these topics on your kids. Um, spelling out the rules. So just making it clear what you expect, you know, um, not drinking, not using marijuana, not, you know, using pills, anything along those lines, but just making sure those rules are really clear and keeping them um, consistent. And that can start early um, and you just wanna keep them consistent. Um, explaining your reasons. So this is a great place to use a lot of I statements. So um, instead of just saying, well, because I said so, um, teens tend to really wanna know 
kind of like why. Um, so use a lot of I statements, you know, I'm concerned about your health or I want you to succeed. I want you to have a good future. Um, I'm concerned that you'll get hurt, things like that. So just explaining your reasoning um, can be a really powerful way to connect. Um, obeying the golden rule. So we all know, you know, treat others the way that you would like to be treated. Um, that goes for teens too. They are very sensitive to kind of condescending tones, um, to feeling like they're being talked down to. Um, like I was a teenager once and I hated that when adults treated me like a child. So talk to them like they are an adult. Um, that can be a really strong way to connect and to show that you are concerned and you do care and you do want to talk to them on their level. Um, letting them speak. So just letting them come to you and talk about concerns that they have. Um, and this doesn't necessarily just have to be about drugs, but knowing that they can trust you um, to talk about kind of any topic is a great way to make those connections and, and make sure that that um, communication avenue is open. Um, and then there's this, I learned it from you dilemma. Um, so Kate kind of talked about it, touched on it in this small talks one, but like, oh, well, why do you drink? Or like, I see you do this, or, you know, you told me that one time you, you did X, Y, Z or whatever. Um, that can be, uh, that can be something that's hard to, to talk about, but you don't want to like shy away from that. If there is something you can, um, that's a great time to own up to it and a good way to also use those I statements in your reason. So like, yes, I did this and I regret it because this, or I did this and it had these consequences and I don't want that for you. Um, conditional amnesty. So this kind of refers to letting your teen know that if something does happen, if they do drink underage or they do use the substance or they find themselves in a situation that they don't want to be in or where they feel unsafe that they can call you for a ride home out of that so if they go out with a friend and their friend gets really drunk and they don't want to ride home with them um they can call you and you'll go pick up them and their friend um or if you know they use a drug and they don't want to come home or they're afraid but just knowing that they can call you to kind of be that out um and then you follow through on that, go pick them up. Um, even if it's two in the morning, pick them up, get them home, let them, you know, be safe. And maybe we have that conversation the next morning. It's not immediately grounding them or attacking them for using um, or for doing something and then coming to you about it. Um, and then keeping it open as an ongoing conversation. So Kate talked about in the small talks, those can start at age five or six. Um, and, and continue, but even if it's starting later, um, 13, 14, just kind of keeping that conversation always ongoing, touching in, touching base, um, even when they graduate high school and go to college, um, keeping in contact. So just knowing that it's always an ongoing and kind of evolving conversation, it's probably gonna have rocky spots at times. Um, you know, we were all teenagers at one point, um, but just knowing, you know, keeping it going and, and just keeping those communication lines open can be powerful. Um, so this resource, like I said, it is in the, um, in the list of links that we'll try to get out as well. Um, and it does expand a lot more on all of those points, but we just wanted to get kind of those tips out there because there's kind of like the meaty part of this. Um, but hopefully those give you some good ideas. Um, all right, and we'll keep going on here. So we've got, um, and then this next one is um, Get Smart About Drugs. So this is another website. Um, this is just a really great place for a lot of information. Um, there's things on there like quizzes. So you can see, I just, this is a screenshot of the front page a couple of days ago, um, but quizzes on like drug um, slang terms, drug paraphernalia. Um, there's articles on, you know, drugs and health, um, things, you know, research that's been published. So this is just a really, solid um, website. This is also a great place to go if you do plan on having a talk with your kid. Um, this can be a really good place to kind of go before you talk to them to sort of get, you know, that knowledge that you need or to kind of pick up on some of those facts that you might need because the more you know, um, the more prepared you're going to be um, when you talk with your child. And then Kate, I'm going to turn it back to you for safe. So kind of at the beginning, I told you that I work with the SAD or SAFE groups. Um, so SAFE was formerly SAD. So SAD is Students Against Destructive Decisions. And then it had multiple names before that. Some of you might have known it as MAD. Um, but recently we made a name change. We talked with the students and they really wanted to get away from kind of like the words against and destructive. Um, so we change it to safe. It's students advocating for excellence. Um, the first school that made the name change was Fall Creek, and they've done a lot of great things that has come from it. Um, so we still 
focus on substance misuse prevention, but we also started looking at the mental health, distracted driving, healthy relationships, all of that stuff. Um, because when we talked to the students about the name change, they really wanted to um, focus on the topics that they were passionate about and also still talk about the whole, so like the mock car crash um, and those type of things. Um, so safe is safe chapters are student run groups in schools that are focused on peer to peer education. So it's really students leading and advocating for uh, around issues that they're passionate about, and to focus on improving the lives of fellow students. Um, we want safe to promote healthy um, student. We want safe to promote student health. Uh, resiliency, leadership, and advocacy skills um, so that they can use these skills in the future. And then um, kind of going off of this, when I think it was October, I came with Amanda Davis. She's a school consult. We talked to Regis um, and we kind of did a brief, not really a full advocacy training, um, but we talked about um, how they can be a leader, how they can be an advocate, how they can um, start getting information about things that they're passionate and then go from there. So we really want this group to be more of, like I said, like student led versus student told. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I have to say about that. But the safe advisor at Regis is Tracy Yango, and she has a pretty great group of kids that are involved now, but they're always looking for more students. So if that's useful for you guys, <laughs> uh, next slide. So these are all the websites that we talked about. Um, we will send Krissa a document tomorrow with all the resources, but we wanted to give you guys a chance to ask us questions and then we'll add more resources if we need to at the end. Um, but our contact information, so myself and Margaret, and then also the Alliance facilitator is Allison. So if you want to get involved with um, the Alliance, you can reach out to her or you can reach out to us. And then we're done talking at you and then 45-ish <laughs> minutes of that. Yeah. <laughs> so if anyone has questions, we will try our best to answer them. Yeah. <laughs> anyone? Where in Eau Claire is the Delta 8 being sold? Do you know? Um, Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's in a lot. I, off the top of my head, I cannot remember like specific store names. Um, I know there's a couple, I think there's two on Water Street. Um, there's a couple on London Road around there. Um, yeah, I can't, it, so we did it like last fall. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's at, you know, stores that sell typically vaping products, um, other tobacco products. Um, is that regulated by the age of 18 or is there no age limit on it at all? Um, I believe it is technically 18 to buy. Um, but again, there's really not a lot of regulation around it. Um, mm -hmm. not even in terms of like processing or anything. So it's, it's new and yeah we really don't know a lot um if you could tell nobody about that we'd like to not deal with that one in schools <laughs> you know just kind of tuck it away hide it um yes i'm all into avoiding headaches <laughs> that's fair so with the delta eight i know there's target like there's the the, the space across by um, like Plato's Closet and stuff. That's one place that sells Delta 8, I know for sure, because they always have giant signs. Really great for that. Um, but also like Azara, all the CBD stores that you That's see on um, London Road, you'll see a bunch of signs that say Delta 8 on it too. Um, and I even think some are getting into gas stations already. So pretty soon you'll see that a lot. <laughs> but going back to the 18 thing, so it's a really fuzzy situation. So it's kind of like um, with CBD and like vapes and stuff, it, the, the federal law is 21, but it still has to be adapted by the state to be 18 uh, or like, or to be 21. So right now the state can sell it at 18, but technically 
it's 21. So it's really a big giant mess. Um, so it's probably not a great answer for your question, but <laughs> actually, actually that gives a lot of clarity to understand that exactly where it's at though. That's helpful. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> yep. Anyone else? When do you think that the results from this most recent uh, youth risk behavior survey might be coming back around? Oh, I wish um, I wish I had a solid answer for you. Um, I don't. Um, we were hoping they would it would be out by now. Um, our hope is by mid March, um, which means we'd be able to kind of process and get stuff out. Um, you know, within probably a couple of weeks, um, depending on how busy I get. But I I honestly do not have an answer for you. That happens at the um, up at DPI. Um, and we're just, we just wait. They don't really tell us uh, anything. So I'm, I'm hopeful by March, but I, that's, that's a pure guess and a lot of optimism on my part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, if nobody else has questions, I think we can end in prayer in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Yes. We appreciate it. Thank you both yeah. very much for all your time and energy tonight. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having us. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye.